ready? Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome. How are you all? Good. Hooray. You're applauding yourself for making a great choice and being here on a Thursday night in Tucson. Well done. Um, we're so glad you're here. My name is Tyler. I work as the director at the Poetry Center. It's great to see a crowd here. Uh, and again, you've chosen the right place. We're thrilled to have Dion Irving here, who's traveled to be here with us, helping launch the season this year at the Poetry Center. This is a collaboration that happens with the Creative Writing Program, and it's called the Distinguished Visiting Writers Series. So Dion is presenting in that series. And I want to shout out and give big kudos to Bojan Lewis, who's organizing that this year, a great collaborator and colleague. Um, and then also to Kate Bernheimer, who's directing the creative writing program with gratitude. No. <laughs> um, we're lucky to have awesome colleagues and really grateful for it. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things from the Poetry Center. First is that the courses at the Poetry Center are open for registration. A few of them have sold out already. Um, there are nine of them that are uh, available this fall season. And so if you're interested in things such as Whitmanic expansiveness, or literary influences and uh, your own and others. Um, the seductions of voice, writing ecologies and others, there are classes for you. They're all available in our calendar, which is sleek and delightful and fits well in dorm rooms, on fridges, in your houses. So pick them up. There's some over there that are for sale on the book table. So when you're buying all of Dion's books after the reading, you can also take home a calendar. Uh, and there's also, I think, some just right outside as well. So grab one of those. You'll learn all about what's happening at the Poetry Center, those courses that I mentioned, and then what's coming up next for us, which is a reading from the poet Paisley Rechtal. Uh, and Paisley will be here on the 21st of September uh, at 7 o'clock back here at the Poetry Center. We're really thrilled about Paisley's visit, uh, which was postponed from the pandemic. So uh, we're finally making good on it, and we're thrilled to have her coming. So we'll see you back here then. And the last thing I want to say is, did anybody here do the Sealy Challenge this time? Oh, some of you did. Good work. Um, come see me afterwards, because if you have completed it, we have these very special golden seals, or as we're calling them, golden sealies. Um, and we'll be happy to share them with you for doing this. This, this is a challenge that we've uh, partnered up with um, that happens in internet spaces. Uh, it is 31 books of poems in 31 days. So a book a day for the month of August. So if you missed it this year, you get a chance again in 12 months. Uh, and we're really excited about it. So good work to everybody who did it. Come get your stickers afterwards. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome up my colleague and my friend Bojan Lewis, who's going to introduce Dion Irving. Thanks again, everybody, for being here. Dion, Bojan. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, honored to have Dion come all the way out here. Um, I'm keeping my introduction brief because you don't want to hear me. Yeah. Uh, so Dion Irving is originally from Toronto, Ontario. She's the author of Quint and the Islands. Um, her work has appeared in Story, Boulevard, Lit Hub, Missouri Review, New Delta Review, and um, among other journals and magazines. Irving teaches in creative writing program and the Initiative on Race and Resilience at the University of Notre Dame. Um, Irving's debut collection was also a 2023 Penn Faulkner finalist. Um, yeah, pretty badass. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I first encountered Dion Irving's work at the Miami Book Fair, where I attended a panel of stellar Jamaican writers. Her work and presence stood out to me, and I immediately went and purchased the islands and cracked into it and read all of it. Um, Irving's characters are complex, though they often fail to recognize their own complexity, which sets them adrift in the ocean of their communities and relationships. Um, I just want to say I just taught a couple of her stories in my fiction workshop, and it inspired like over two hours of impassioned, critical discussion. And it was just simply amazing. So let's just hear from Dion herself. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Is that all right? Okay, good. Thank you all so much for coming out, and thank you to the Poetry Center for hosting me, and to Bojan for in inviting me. Um, I, it, it's been so nice to travel with this book. I remember when I turned in the final edits, I said to my husband, well, 
no one's going to want to read that. Um, so it's been really nice to see that people um, have, have read the book at all. Um, and I think that's not a guarantee when you, when you put out a book. So. Um, so I'm going to read, I was trying to decide what to read for you, but I think I'm going to read um, a story I don't read very often. Uh, but we were talking a little bit about travel at, at dinner, and uh, this felt like a good one. So this story is called An American Idea of Fun. Patricia's parents agreed all too easily about her spending the summer in France. It will help your French, said her father with delight, as though three semesters with a teacher from Ohio who called herself Madame Roger, even though her last name was Rogers, had somehow made Patricia fluent. What a wonderful opportunity, said her mother. Aren't you lucky that the Claudels are willing to do this for you? Yes, the Claudels were friends, and yes, they had three small children, but what had they really known about them? Her parents were dazzled by the ways in which they seemed so rich, so sophisticated. The Claudels were the only white family her parents entertained regularly, even though they lived in a house in a part of Cleveland where they were the only black family, and Patricia had always and forever been the only black girl in her grade or her class or her school. The other black families they mixed with were from church or people they had known from Trinidad who lived in cities close by and who were also doctors, lawyers, and professors, and also the only black people in their own neighborhoods. And probably over the year, they had become closer and closer to the Claudels and their three small children. Each of the Claudels was half French, but they'd had it all bred out with a strong set of ruddy Midwestern features. They looked more like Idaho potato farmers, but with a name reeking of pretension. They spent the school year in America and then went to their home in Montpellier for July and August. Patricia wasn't even sure where her parents had met the Claudels, but from the time she was 10, they had been turning up for dinners at least once a month. The day of these dinners, her mother painstakingly made recipes from a battered Betty Crocker cookbook and used the copper pots that hung in their kitchen, and she vacuumed twice. Patricia had plenty of white friends. She rarely brought them home, embarrassed by her parents' lilting Trinidadian accents, the way the cadence of their sentences always made it seem like they were asking a question. On the few early occasions she'd had a friend over, they'd always, they always asked where her parents were from and why they talked so funny. She stopped having people over. She didn't want to see their eyes on the living room furniture, the sofa and chairs covered in plastic, each squeak against the covered brown velour cushions, a tangible reminder of how her parents had come here with nothing and how now they had this big house. Two days after the end of the school year, her mother dropped her off at the airport in Atlanta and gave her a long distance calling card and a jar of peanut butter. Just in case you don't like the food, her mother said smiling, I know how much you American girls like your peanut butter. Fuck you, thought Patricia. You don't even know me. But instead, she said, thanks, mommy, and put both items in her bag. She hugged her mother, inhaling the powdery sweet smell, then went through security without looking back. In Europe, she imagined she would be a different person, that the travel would be her chrysalis, and on the other side of the world, she would emerge a new person. Patricia had been brought up to dress, in a, certain, dress a certain way. When she was a child, most people always commented on how fancy she looked, almost old-fashioned for 1985. While the little white boys and girls in her class wore jeans or cut-off shorts, she turned up to birthday parties decked out in the stiff crinoline and starched white socks that her mother had chosen. Her mother followed behind her in a pair of smart slacks or a silk dress. She looked nothing like the mothers who greeted her in overalls, sometimes streaked with flour from baking a birthday cake, nails chewed to the quick. Patricia's hair was always pressed, collars always ironed, a wrinkle or a crease was a sign of lax moral character. On the plane, she changed out of her pleated skirt and Peter Pan collar blouse into ripped acid wash jeans and an esprit sweatshirt. She jammed both the skirt and blouse into the trash, hoping to never see their kind again. As they sped over the Atlantic, she flirted with a British boy with pretty blue eyes and no chin, who disappeared into the crowd once they landed. She tried to hide her disappointment, most of all from herself. Who was that girl, she wanted people to think, all of them dazzled by her American glamour. She wanted to be the black Jackie O. She wanted to be the black Grace Kelly. 
Instead, she felt ugly and frumpy and impossibly fat. On the train from London to Paris, she put on her sunglasses and pretended to read a book by Heidegger that the librarian had suggested, even though she didn't understand a word. Later, when she remembers this time, she will see how pretty she was, a slip of a girl, really, long and thin in the way girls are at 15 and then never again. The French countryside slipped by, the fields of lavender, towns that looked as though they'd been put together with piles of brick. And then she was there, the train from Paris depositing her in Montpellier's city center. Outside the station, the wide boulevards were scrubbed clean, waiting for her in front of a tiny car, dusty underneath the blazing hot sun, was Mr. Claudel. She'd never seen him like this before, his shirt bright pink, printed with tiny white goldfish and unbuttoned midway down his chest. His lady snatching threads, she imagined and tried not to laugh. And so you've arrived, darling. He clapped his hands and reached out to hug her, which felt awkward and weird, both because her family were not hugging people and because she had never so much as shaken his hand. The darling thing was even weirder than the hug. He called her darling as they drove up into the hills, once even sliding his hand over the back of her head and down her shoulders. The Claudel's house was a 200-year-old cottage situated on a bluff above the city. The dusty gardens, the moldering old barn, the cistern, and the clean, slightly salty air made her love it all the more. It was everything she had imagined France to be. Her skin went from bronze to dark in a matter of days. She took to lining her eyes in a deep coal as she would continue to do for the rest of her life. And during her second week there, without telling anyone, she went into a French barber and had her hair cut very short, just like Jean Seberg in Breathless. Secretly, she was pleased that she'd been able to explain herself well enough in French. The Claudels made her feel like an adult for the first time in her life. They left her alone during the days with the children, three curly-haired children with what she decided were overly American names, Jennifer, Joshua, and Jack. Mr. Claudel worked in an office over an hour away, and some days Mrs. Claudel worked at the small bookshop that they owned, and on others she shopped or had lunch with friends. Patricia liked her time alone with the children. She sang to them and was a willing assistant in the construction of mud pies or tree forts. Mrs. Claudel taught her to drive one Saturday, and she picked it up quickly, learning to maneuver the Renault up and down hills, stalling only three or four times. It'll be better this way, Mrs. Claudel said. You won't be stuck on this hill all day, and you can run errands for me. In the evening, even if she was worn out, she ventured down from the hills. It was a 30-minute walk into the city center, up and down dark alleyways, and past the cinema that showed mainly American films. She'd never made friends easily, but a pack of girls called out to her one night. She approached the leader, a girl about her age, but a foot shorter. She had stick-straight hair and blood-red nails. You are American? Yes. They gathered around her, peppering her with questions. They loved her hair. They wanted to talk about Michael Jordan and Michael Jackson. They told her stories in English, and she did her best with her French. They mixed up idioms, and she over-explained, telling them that what it, what it meant to plead the fifth or when something was old school. And they told her what it meant to avoir la moutarde qui, vont, qui monte sur au nez or faire la grasse matinée. They were mostly her age, but everything about them seemed older, better, classier. They smoked gawa, wore scarves, and seemed to dress almost entirely in slim black pants and pretty print dresses. They introduced her to friends and friends of friends who had parties, who smoked hashish, and who drank wine from gallon-sized jugs that they sipped instead of, slug, instead of slugged the way the boys did back home. At a party midway through the summer, Someone, she won't be sure who, will put a class in her hand and the room will get hotter and the party will swell as more and more people will crowd into the living room and into the cramped kitchen. Everyone will finally get drunk enough, high enough, and someone will turn the volume up again and she will feel the house music pounding between her temples. It will have a strange grating melody, will not be danceable, but there will be something soothing in its consistency. The boys will look at her strangely as though they are unsure they knew her or unsure they are seeing her in the right place. And when the girls notice the boys doing it, they start to ignore her. 
They slide out of conversation with her, and she's left standing alone and feeling abandoned. She wandered into the backyard, feeling hot and stuffy. The conversations were rapid and quick, the daytime patience of the friends exhausted. Lulled by alcohol and desire, she talked to anyone who looked at her. She doesn't know it then, but this will mirror her adult life, when she will drink too much at parties, drinking until she forgets. In her memories, it will be much more romantic than it actually was. When she comes back from France, this will be the story she will tell over and over again about the French boy. She will spend years describing him as a great love, impossibly handsome and cool. But the truth is that he will be a pretty ordinary teenage French boy with a faint mustache, a cluster of angry red pimples on his temples, and a pork pie hat, who grabbed at her, whispered to her in French that she was beautiful, making something tingle inside her that felt exciting and powerful. He said something she didn't understand, frowning at her, but the darkness covered the parts of his face that would help her understand if he was sad or angry. He put his hands around her waist, moved with her to the music. Move your hips, he whispered into her ear over and over again. She did the best she could, struggled to find a way she should move to the syncopated beats, and eventually just gave up and shook her ass, her cheeks hot with embarrassment. Oh yes, he murmured, twirling her, you've got it now. Eventually, he pulled her into a corner, rolled a joint, and shared it with her, kissed her so hard, mashed his mouth so forcefully into hers that she tasted blood. It was an eventful four hours. Just before dawn, he took her into the smokehouse at the edge of the property. Even in the dark, she could see the shady outlines of pig and chicken carcasses hung above the rafters. The sawdust shifted under her feet, and the boy drew her in close. You scared, he said, in a way that she assumed that he must have thought sounded tender. She shook her head no, even though she was both terrified and excited. The boy stuck his hand under her shirt, his tongue in her mouth, and to her surprise, all she felt was boredom. This is the feeling she will always try to ignore when she grows up. But at the time, she kissed him back harder, trying to figure out what was wrong. They stayed there for a while until she begged off, tipsy and dizzy and a little nauseated. Back to the Renault and down the winding hills as the sun came up a little at a time, illuminating first the red dust on the road and then the walled fortress of the town itself. And finally, as she sputtered toward the long pebble drive of the Claudel's home, the ocean. The next day, she took a long walk with the children, chasing them around the overgrown gardens. Mrs. Claudel took them all into town to buy a raft of pastries and cheese, of jams and tiny pots and cured meats. She picked up half a dozen jars of cornichon and four pounds of butter before they all piled back into the Renault and made their way up the hillside. That evening, the Claudels had friends in town from Paris. She was instructed to feed the children early and put them into bed before sunset. Mrs. Claudel was not one to indulge in the type of French mothering that would ruin a dinner party. The guests arrived in cars loaded with four, then two, then six people. She greeted them at the door, collected an assortment of scarves and handbags that were tucked inside the pantry door. They hugged her. They called her la petite negresse charmant. And one man, a business associate of Mr. Claudel's, she'd met a time or two, grabbed her ass and gave her a big wet kiss on the cheek. She wasn't invited to the table, so she ate dinner alone in her room, reading, but listening to, for bursts of laughter, the clink of glasses, or footsteps on the stairs. Eventually, she fell asleep, and when she woke up, it was still dark. She heard the crunch of tires on the gravel driveway, the last goodbyes, and realized slowly that it wasn't yet morning. She went downstairs to the now empty kitchen. The sink was piled high with pots, the counter a mess of sticky wine glasses and plates with leftover pools of sauce and congealed flecks of butter. She would have to wash these in the morning. There was still a smattering of voices outside. She opened one of the pots, barely chewing before she swallowed the remnants of a cassoulet. The duck grease made her mouth slick and she wiped at it with the back of her hand. She poured herself wine into one of the children's juice glasses. Out in the garden, she stood behind a shrub and watched the last of the adults migrate into the house for one last drink, one last cigarette before getting on the road. She was still learning to smoke, and so she took tentative puffs from the hand-rolled cigarette one of the party guests had given her. 
She sipped the wine, looking up into a sky so clear and bright, nothing like the sky she knew at home. She wrote during this time in her journal. She had wanted then to be a writer, and before that an actress, and later on a psychiatrist. When the guests were gone, she moved into the space they'd left behind, moving the half-spent wine glasses and overflowing ashtrays to sit in one of the now vacant chairs. You look, he said, like a garden nymph sitting here, surrounded by beauty. It was Mr. Claudel. He startled her, and she dribbled a little wine down the front of the pink peasant blouse she'd purchased that afternoon while wandering through the alleyways of the city as she waited for Mrs. Claudel to finish shopping. He sat in the garden chair next to her and stared at the night sky. I never get used to the sky in America with all the lights ruining the stars, he said. Below them, Montpellier glittered, and she could see the outline of the old Roman aqueducts surrounding the town, holding it in from the rest of the world. She thought then it was like a fairy tale, like a castle with a moat. You see the aqueducts, yes, he said. Yes, she said, but I thought those kinds of things were only in Italy. The Romans, he said, were everywhere. She tried to imagine it, Roman soldiers with spears and shields marching through southern France, but she kept picturing the mustachioed French kid dressed like a gladiator. When she thought back to this time as an adult, those aqueducts would seem more like boundaries, far less romantic, a way to keep some in and others out. The Romans were an epic civilization. When he said the word Romans with his accent, it sounded like Romans, and she had to keep herself from laughing. Are they very old, she asked instead. She was playing dumb. Of course she knew the Romans were old. She was in Latin club and on the debate team. She was the kind of girl who sometimes ate lunch in the library. She wasn't sure why she decided to pretend. I believe they were built around 19 BC. It wasn't until later that she figured out that he didn't know either. It wasn't until later, much later, that she realized how boring and simple he was, how little he knew about his own city. The aqueducts were fakes. They were built in the 17th century. He took rolling paper and tobacco from his pocket. He rolled her a fresh cigarette and then one for himself. It's amazing that they're still here, she said. Beauty never entirely fades. It may be diminished, but it won't go away. The Romans knew how to make things that were both beautiful and functional. She liked the way he spoke, the way he tossed things like this offhand. He lit both cigarettes and handed her one. Are you having a nice summer, he asked. Very nice, she said, and educational. It was something her parents had trained her to say, and Monsieur Claudel laughed. It shouldn't be educational, you are young, you need to have fun, I guess, she said. At age 40, with her therapist, she tries to figure out what had really happened that summer and starts to realize that his idea of fun, in its very French way, would be the excuse he used for everything that happened from then on. The way he spirited her, spirited her away to the beach, took her to a wonderful restaurant, bought expensive dresses she would never wear again, and when he finally came to her bed. But that night, she wasn't sure what he meant. She took a drag off the cigarette and accidentally inhaled the smoke stinging her throat and making her eyes water. She coughed hard, and Mr. Claudel came over from his chair. He patted her on the back. Be careful, he said, and don't let your parents know that we let you smoke, or drink for that matter. He sat next to her on the grass instead of going back to the other chair. It felt nice to have him at her feet, to sit above him. There was something about looking down that made her feel like she was in control. It made her feel like she was in charge even though later she will understand that she never was. I'm so glad you could come. Every young girl should have the chance to go abroad, and Martine really needed the help this summer. He got quiet again, and she tried to think of something to say, something to talk about that made her sound grown up. I've really liked all the walking and the shopping here. I feel like I've lost a ton of weight just walking to the market and back. They stopped talking, and she could hear the chirp of cicadas in the trees. Did you know, he said finally, that you can exercise your abdomen just by holding your breath? That can't be true. Oh yes, he said, getting very animated. I've read all about it. They've done these tests at the American University in Paris where they show that holding your breath, if done correctly, can actually strengthen the abdominal wall, make it stronger. Let's hold our breath for a moment. Let's see if we can feel it. They were quiet for a minute until she finally exhaled in a dramatic puff and Mr. Cla Mr. Claudel smiled and exhaled slowly. Did you feel it, he asked. 
Kind of, she said. Mostly her lungs and her cheeks burned. She wanted to best him. You must not be doing it correctly. Here, stand up. He got up and came around behind her and put his hand on her abdomen. Hold your breath, he said. She sucked in and she felt the warm weight of his hand on her stomach. Hold it as long as you can. She felt the tightening of her stomach muscles and the pressure of his hand became more firm. She could feel the muscles in her stomach flex and tighten and she heard Mr. Claudel's breathing quicken. Okay, he said, breathe out. She exhaled in a rush, just as Mrs. Claudel came out into the yard, and Mr. Claudel let go of her quickly and stepped back, putting his hands on his hips. Did you feel the difference, he asked curtly. Yes, she said, I did. In her 20s, when Mr. Claudel emails her after he has met one of her boyfriends at her parents' house or seen pictures from her trip to Mexico with girlfriends, he always sends her the same message. This is an American idea of fun. The phrase, more than anything else, makes her feel ashamed. She is barely out of college when she meets a self-proclaimed communist at a bar on the east side where all the kids from Brown hang out and talk politics or trust funds. The communist has a soft smile that could make anyone give up capitalism. She's drinking white wine and flipping through a catalog, trying to ignore the loud music when he approaches her. Catalog, he asks? Mm-hmm. He looks past her arms at the step stool for a, dog, for a dog, the toaster that cooks hot dogs and the seat warmers. Tools of the wealthy, he says. Her features are sharp with edges like cut glass. She no longer has any of the softness that makes some women cute. She isn't cute. She is beautiful, and that beauty, when she executes it, can be intimidating. The communist's name is Brad, and she tells him that is a dumb name for a communist that the name itself is reminiscent of Izod shirts and date rape drugs. Later, she would tell her girlfriend that he had what looked like violation eyes, the kind of eyes that, you can, that can see right through you, the kind of eyes that wouldn't let her get up and walk away. The bar starts to clear out, and even though he is talking her ear off, even though her glass has been empty for quite some time, he doesn't offer to buy her a drink. The college students are replaced by the nighttime Euro trash that seem to love the place, buying expensive wine as though America is just one big Kmart blue light special. When they speak about beauty, they split it into the physical and the emotional. Brad says there are merits of womanhood, a phrase that makes her want to puke, and which according to Brad gives her gender a predilection for egalitarianism. And she bushes back, telling him he must not know women, Brad, the communist, shrugs it off as though capitalism has made her immune to understanding. He drinks tepid water with a soggy bit of lime floating on the scummy surface. A water supply long ago tainted by the mills and the factories that ruined Providence before it ruined itself. And why do you come to bars if you don't drink, she hears herself asking. The bars are the consolation of the oppressed worker, he says. His only respite, his only comfort. This bar is not a working man's bar. This bar is all slickly polished stone and chrome. He sells the daily worker on campus and downtown at the train station. Brown students will press money into his hand on a dare or as a joke, and he makes a living of it. Still, she wonders what he's doing in a place like this where everything is expensive, where everyone is oppressive. Know your enemy, he says. When the communist takes her home, he takes off all her clothes before he takes off his own. He stops and stares for a moment, making her feel embarrassed, so she moves her hands to hide herself. But the communist gently lifts her hands away from her breasts and places them on his own shoulders, and then he undresses. He made love with, a slow, with slow and practiced hands, but it was though he had gleaned all his moves from an R&B song. Patricia wanted to laugh at his caress. It seemed utterly ridiculous to feel his hands on her body and listen to the croon of instructions in her ear as he told her to move this way or that. After that first night in Brad the Communist's alarming gaze, like he can see through her, through her act, she's unable to decide if he's sexy or scary. She finally lands on the idea that he's a little of both. Patricia sends him a one-word text, hi. A few moments later, he texts back, Drinks tonight? She is working and she answers two client emails before she responds. Sure, 6 p.m. While dating Brad the communist, she will feel both proud and ashamed. 
she will start to quote Marx and she will never let Brad meet the Claudels or her parents. Eventually, Brad will get a real job and take some money from the parents who are, of course, very wealthy. That was how it was in those post-college years where everyone was trying things on and then rejecting them. The pretense of communism will continue, of course, mostly through a subscription to the daily worker, but he is on a management track. Five years pass before she even knows it. She finds herself telling friends that he is her future husband. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. The future perfect is always more interesting than the present complicated. Towards the end, she spends a lot of time waiting for him, listening to excuses for missed dinners or movies. He is cheating, probably, with the kind of girl who owns more than one pair of sweatpants, who gets her hair cut in a shopping mall. She will find digital pictures of this woman in various states of polyester undress. This woman, really? The slave to capitalism? It was disappointing in more ways than one. She starts to spend entire nights away from the house. She meets a new set of girlfriends and stays out until 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., and 7 even. He isn't phased, takes it all in stride, says he's glad she's having fun. She snorts coke with clients. She palms the ass of her friend's teenage son. She puts a laxative in Brad's coffee, and she feels nothing. These things she does to jar herself out of her life, uh, these things she's doing to jar herself out of her life don't work. One early evening, Patricia sits on the stoop, recovering from a hangover, enjoying the breeze on her face. The little girl from next door walks over with a kind of world weariness and plops down next to her. She's met the little girl once before. She can't remember if her name is Karen or Kristen. She's wearing clean shorts and a t-shirt with stained remnants of what looked like Kool-Aid and mustard. Have you seen Jason, the little girl says by way of greeting. I don't know who Jason is, she answers. She checks her watch again. He's over an hour late. She thinks about leaving and wonders if he would notice. The little girl looks at her pityingly. She's cute in the way ugly children are sometimes. Her features a little too large for her tiny head. Her mother has plaited her hair far too tightly, pulling back the features on her face and making her look like a child who's recently had a poorly done facelift. The little girl will be a striking woman when she gets older, but now she's just odd looking. Can I come in, the little girl asks. I wanna see if your house looks different than mine. It's nearly winter, and in the last of the late afternoon, the last of the late afternoon sun has long since dipped below the horizon. Patricia considers what it means to be the childless couple who lets small children into their condo after dark. What type of person does that, she wonders. Okay, she says, but just for a second. Brad, who is performing less and less like a communist every day, has chosen this place. Brad, who she imagines right this second, is putting his hand on some young girl's stomach, whispering in that girl's ear instructions about how to breathe, or correcting her posture, or explaining that some, that some young girl's Zara dress makes her a cog in the wheel of the capitalist conspiracy before depositing that young girl's $15 dress on the floor. There are women she meets at his office parties who won't look her in the eye. There are interns who say that they are excited to meet her and disappear before they can even begin a conversation. And she knows that she was, them, she was once them and that she is now Mrs. Claudel, who never looked at Patricia the same way after that summer, never invited her back to France. By the time she takes the little girl inside, it's already dark. With no lights on, the condo feels colder than normal. The fluorescent lights reflect off the newly purchased stainless steel appliances. The granite countertops, they haven't been used for anything other than a surface on which to do lines of coke. And she thinks again about why she lets this little girl in her house. She doesn't know what she's doing. Don't you have any toys? The girl asks. No. The little girl walks all around the apartment. She opens cabinets and drawers, and Patricia just lets her. She sits on the couch in the living room while the girl looks under beds, in closets, pulls things out and examines them. The girl finally comes into the living room and sits next to her on the couch. You really don't have any toys, she says with a sigh. It's after seven now, and she still hasn't heard from him. She doesn't know yet that this will be it, that after this night, things will be over between them. Do you have any cookies at least? No. There isn't any food in the house at all, nothing to eat, nothing to cook with, Lots of paper plates and takeout menus, but that's all. 
She wants all of a sudden to get this little girl out of the house. She can pull apart his closet like she's done so many nights before, searching for a note, a receipt, something she hasn't even thought of yet. The little girl sighs. You don't have anything good. It's true. She doesn't have anything good. She isn't anything good. She wants to tell this little girl that there isn't anything good about being a grown-up woman, that she should try to stay young as long as possible. She wants to tell her not to rush men or boys. She wants to tell her to avoid them at all costs if possible. But this isn't possible. It won't work. It never has. When he gets home, things will be broken. When he gets home, she will be screaming. When he gets home, she will be broken, not by him, but in spite of him. It isn't pretty, but men love hysterical beauty, and he will beg her to stay. Thank you. Questions? Hmm? I never know how to do these. <laughs> Were you an exchange student of some kind? No, <laughs> no, I wasn't. <laughs> They're not autobiographical for the most part. <laughs> you know, let me just tell I was the head of a boys' boarding school, and uh, one of the nicest boys in the school that was, I thought, a very promising boy. His mother sent him off to Germany for a semester and for a summer. And when he came back, he was smoking. He had become <laughs> violent. He was, his whole personality had changed, and I had to expel him from the school. Maybe teenagers shouldn't go to Europe. <laughs> I have a question. It's a naive poet's question, but how did you know where this story was ending? Or how did you land on the ending? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I think it kind of happens. I like the idea with this story of like sort of these looks ahead and looks back that happen like throughout the story. And I, I like the idea of like, you know, I probably tell my mom's a therapist, like this idea of the way like the past inform the future and, and you know, that you can't understand sort of the resonance of these things, but that memory sort of churns them all up. And so like, you know, that that felt sort of like a stopping point where she, where those two pieces kind of coalesced that she sort of traded places in, in that narrative of, of herself and, and that sort of felt like where the story needed to, to stop. Thank you. Did you start at the like chronological beginning, or did you start with a different scene or time period? I wish I could remember. I wrote this story like over a period of many years, so I don't remember which came first. That's a little different then. Did yeah. you move along it with like a either planning wise with the kind of chronological order, or just writing wise, or were you kind of figuring out where you needed to move in time with the character as you went? I think I was interested in the character, and I think I kept like writing these little scenes from her life, and I wasn't kind of sure how they would all fit together. Um, and as I started to write more and more of them, I was like, oh, I think this might be one story. I thought maybe they were like separate stories, and then I kind of realized that like she kept sort of coming back to the same things as I was writing these moments from her life. And so then it was, I think, thinking a little bit about how to stitch those together, but I don't remember like which of those moments I wrote first. So I, I was writing a bunch of them over, over a period of several years. You know, I was, I was interested in her as a, as a character and, and thinking about sort of how to tie them all together. What were some of the, since I'm zooming out a bit, to the island as a whole, as a collection, what were some of the challenges you found writing short stories and comparisons like novel writing? I missed the last part of your question. In to say novel writing, what were some of the sort of challenges Oh, yeah. I mean, I think I'm not a novelist. <laughs> I think I'm actually more of a short story writer. I, I love short stories. And I feel like when I teach, students are like, oh, I'm not interested in writing short stories. But they're so much fun to write. I mean, I just I think you actually have to work a lot harder because they do involve, and I think 
poets probably know this intuitively, right? Like thinking about where that idea of compression works, you know, but I feel like compression is such a powerful tool, you know, and I think we lose that sometimes when we talk about prose because so much of prose is like focused on the novel and just expansion. But I think like sometimes the real art comes in with like that idea of compression and like where we make choices to compress. So I, I don't know, I, I love short stories. I think I'm much more a short story writer, but I think you kind of have to write novels. So I'm told. <laughs> My novels, I write like short stories. So. <laughs> Can I ask a political question? Do you feel that uh, your characterization of this woman is inflected by uh, the idea that a, a, a girl's fantasies lead her, as she grows older, to vulnerability to exploitation by by men, mostly. I think, unfortunately, a lot of women that I know have had lots of different kinds of exploitative experiences with men. I think that's sort of the unfortunate part of it. And I feel like only recently are we starting to have real conversations about that, you know? Um, even when I tell my students about, you know, I graduated from grad school, like, maybe 10 years ago, and even when I tell my students some of the things that happened when I was in grad school, they're like, that was okay? And I was like, it was, or we had like sort of decided that we were not gonna talk about those things. And so I feel like that's like a conversation we're only really just starting to have about like different ways that women, you know, are, are exploited, not, you know, I think we sometimes think of, um, things like rape and sexual assault, but there's lots of, of micro kind of versions of exploitation that I think happen to women all the time um, in school, in work, in households, you know. Um, and I think we're only just starting to think about what that really means. I don't think my question was completely clear. Okay. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you thought that something about her naive fantasies or what made her, about what, life was going to be and what, how, how it was going to be fun, that somehow that made her more vulnerable than she might otherwise have been. I don't think it made her more vulnerable. I think that, um, I think all women are sort of, of, of subject to potentially being exploited. I think that I set the story in a particular time in part because of, um, I think for, for, a lot of women who are, you know, that sort of um, first generation of children from baby boomers really got complicated messaging, you know? And like the messaging in some ways was like, you can have it all, right? You can have this rich career and you can also be this amazing mother, but like, it's really hard to have it all, right? And like, that's a really impossible thing. Yeah, I mean, you can't, but then I feel like, you know, um, I guess in, in that way, right, what's, what's interesting to me about her as a character is the idea that like, she has this idea of herself and what her life is gonna be like, and it's the world that comes in and sort of pulls that apart. But in some ways I feel like that's so many characters, that's so many people, right? Like, you know, I think we all have ideas, that's part of adulthood, right? You know, you have these ideas of, of what your life is gonna be, and it's never exactly like what you think it's gonna be. Um, and I said this to my students the other day, I was like, you know, the happy ending maybe that you think of, and if you're happy in your life in some way, shape or form, it might not have been the thing that like when you were 16 that you would have been like, that's the thing that will make me happy, right? Like, um, you know, I, I thought when I was a teenager, like it would be great if like I just go out to clubs every night for the rest of my life. Even when I'm old, I'm gonna go to clubs. No, I, I don't wanna do that now, that sounds horrific. Like, you know, but like you have this idea of what's gonna make you happy, right, at a certain age. And that's gonna always like change and evolve, right? And, and if you're sort of latched onto that one idea, right, well, happiness is sort of, is, is always going to change based on what your circumstances are. So she was a boomer in your imagination. First, like, children, ch child of boomers, so. <laughs> so. Did she grow up to be a Xer? I guess, yeah, I guess she would be, be Gen X, yeah. Um, what story did you have the most fun writing? Oh, 
I don't know. I mean, they're all fun and they're all hard, right? Like, um, the second story in my collection, which is the shortest one, um, and probably the most personal one in the collection, um, is probably the one that came the most quickly. Um, uh, I, I grew up in my, my parents' um, grocery, in Jamaican grocery store in Canada, um, and I had been wanting to write about that for a long time, but I just couldn't ever quite get it right. Um, and I had to write this thing for New Flash Fiction Review, and the story just kind of poured out of me in a weird way. And I just, I couldn't figure out how to like get all of these various voices that to me were part of that experience into the story. And so in some ways, like the real compressed form actually allowed me to do the thing that I had not been able to do in 3,000 words even, you know, that, that doing it in, in under 1,000 words was actually what I needed to tell that story, you know. Um, but I also think that too speaks to that idea of compression. Sometimes you actually need less words to tell the bigger story than, than more. Does this character appear in any other stories you've written, or will it? <laughs> will she? She <laughs> does not, but there are other characters from the book in my new novel. So. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering, is there any stories that didn't make it into the collection? Yes, a lot of them. <laughs> My edit, I had an amazing, I worked with an amazing, amazing editor, um, but she said to me right away, like, I want to take five stories out of the collection. And I was like, five? <laughs> and she was like, yes. Um, and she was absolutely right. Those five needed to be taken out of the collection. Um, and the collection was much tighter once she took those five stories out. But at first I was like, five whole stories? OK. But once I kind of saw what the collection looked like without those five stories, and she was absolutely right. It, it needed to be shorter and, and tighter and more focused. And she was able to see something, I think, that I was not able to see for sentimentality and, you know. <laughs> Kate, did you have a yeah. Oh, you said that you think of yourself as a story writer, and I, but I was going to just ask you what you like to read. Um, and if there was like a, a story or a book that you encountered when you were much younger that made you think, I, I want to do that. Yeah. Are any of you undergraduates here? Undergraduates? Yeah. OK. So when I was an undergraduate at Florida State in Tallahassee, I had to I got forced to go to a reading by a professor in my creative writing class. And it was Joyce Carol Oates. I had no idea who Joyce Carol Oates was at the time, but I was like, all right, this will be fine. And she read, where are you going? Where have you been? And that story just gobsmacked me. I mean, I had never read that story before, and I was just knocked sideways by it. I mean, it's such an amazing story. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, that those look forwards, right? That she has in there that are so are so cool, and I just I was blown away by that story, and I was like, I gotta try that, you know. Um, and I think I don't know. I mean, I I went to a nice good high school, but you know, I remember the short stories we read in there. I always tell my students. I remember reading. What's the Sarah Orne Jewett story that's always anthologized? And I remember it was just pain to read, like a white heron. That's what it is. And I just hated that story so much. <laughs> and I was like, maybe I don't like shorts. But then I, like, you know, Joyce Carol Oates read this story, and I was just, wow, is that what a story can do? Is that what a story can be? And that for me was just huge. I just couldn't stop reading stories after that. I mean, I just was like, there's so many amazing things you can do with this form. So Kate kind of asked part of my question, but the question was um, who influenced you and then how do you hope to influence others as like a legacy in, in your writing? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things for me too that, um, and I was saying, you know, when I, I sent the book out for after the final edits, I was saying no one wants to read this, you know. I mean, I did not read any stories about, you know, people like me who were children of the diaspora. You know, there was African-American lit and there was contemporary American lit with majority white characters, but I didn't have a lot of stories that I'd read about like immigrants, you know? I think I read Girl by Jamaica Kincaid when I was an undergrad and that was the only one I remember reading. And, you know, I, I was desperate for those, those kinds of stories, right? For thinking about stories that spoke to like, this idea of liminality, of being between two places and between two cultures. And I, 
I wanted to tell that story, but I also really wanted to read that story, you know, when, when I was, was starting to really get engaged by stories. And, and that was the thing. And it took me a very long time even to have the courage to tell those stories. I mean, when I, I started graduate school, I was not writing those, those kinds of stories. I was writing much, much different kinds of stories. And I think in part that came from the experience of feeling like um, that, was not an, that was not something anyone wanted to read about, the loneliness and the sadness and the liminality that comes with living between two places and two cultures. Um, and I think that it took me a long time to, to be able to write those stories. And I'll tell you, Oscar Wow came out when I was in graduate school. And that, for me, gave me a lot of permission to kind of start telling those stories. Because that book came out, and I was like, this is a story about immigrants and about people living between two cultures and two places. And it won a Pulitzer Prize. So certainly, maybe there's somebody that want, somebody else that wants to read those kinds of stories. And I think sometimes that's what it takes, right? Um, not that you need permission from somebody, but I think that especially the experience of going through um, graduate programs when I, when I started going to graduate school was very much like, this is the kinds of stories you should be writing, right? And you know, I, I remember um, you know, turning a, the first story in, in workshop where I had you know, um, characters who were children of immigrants, and somebody was like, I don't, I don't understand this. Like, what's the story really about? Like, if the parents are Jamaican, aren't they Jamaican too? And I'm like, well, no, because they grew up in a whole other country, you know? And that was, even having to explain that, um, felt like super personal, right? Felt like I was exposing a part of myself and, and felt like I was um, having to explain something. And so, you know, I hope that in, in some ways that the collection can, can be those kinds of stories. I think that one of the cool things about traveling with the book this past year, um, especially with that story of Shop Girls, like I've met um, other women who say, I grew up in my parents' Korean, you know, grocery. I grew up in my parents' bodega, and this rings very true to me. And so to me, it's not just the story about, like, being from the islands, but what that story of immigration means and liminality means. That was awesome. One more round of applause for Dion Irving. <laughs> Come by books. I'm sure Dion will be happy to sign them. Keep talking, more conversation, and then we hope to see you back here for Paisley Rectal's reading on the 21st. Thanks again, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next time. <laughs>